What up, Oasis? All right, that's what I'm talking about. It's been a couple weeks. I've missed you guys. I haven't gotten to preach in a little bit. So we are closing this series. But before I get to any of that, I got to tell you about this time. Actually, it's the first time that I thought my marriage was over. And some of you are like, wow, that sounds aggressive. Well, you'll, maybe you'll be married one day. You'll understand. But it was on our honeymoon. And you're like, oh, this gets worse. <laughs> So if you're not familiar, a honeymoon is something that happens right after you do the wedding. So we've been married less than a week, and we decided to take a trip out to the Tetons. Um, We did Yellowstone the first half of the week, and then Tetons the second. So through the first three days, it was pretty, pretty good. You know, a lot of car time, and I don't ride best in the car, so I was a little agitated. We were newly married. You guys know how it goes. Like... But once we got into the trip, it was fine. It was going great. We drove down to the Tetons the second half of the week. And if you're not familiar, there's two lakes down by the Tetons. The first one is Jenny Lake. The second one is Jackson Lake. And Jackson Lake is a big lake. Like, don't think Wall Lake or any lake around here. It's not Lake Campbell. Like, Lake Jackson is huge right at the base of the Tetons. And that is important because Allie and I, we wanted to go kayaking while we were there. And so we went to like one of those shacks that's always a little sketchy when they're, they'll just rent you things. Just like sign this waiver. And you're like, okay, let's see how this goes. And he's like, have you, have, do you have kayaking experience? And we were like, yes, we kayaked at the ponds next to our house growing up. You know, it's like we, we like did like the pool in the backyard type of kayaking, but this was a big lake. And he's like, oh, you'll be fine. So we signed on the dotted line and we paid and we got two hours. And we're about an hour into this trip and things are going great. I actually made you a quick slideshow so you could see. Um, if you guys would throw up those first couple pictures. So yeah, we're having fun. We're messing around on the lake. You can see beautiful skies, freshly married. Like it's going great. Beautiful. I mean, the, the, the scenery, of course, like it's just so nice. And then even more beautiful, the back of my wife's head. Uh, I took that. So you see, things are going great. Blue skies, calm weather. Everything is awesome through the first half. Then it got crazy. He gave us pretty much one piece of advice before he sent out. He said, don't go too far from the coast. And the reason he said that is because on a lake this big, if the wind blows right and a storm starts to brew, it can literally cause actual waves. And so we are kayaking and we are in and out of these different nooks and crannies, checking out wildlife and all the scenery. It is beautiful until all of a sudden I get distracted as the navigator and we're out too far into the lake. In the picture you saw, we rented a double kayak, so there was someone in the front and someone in the back. And you have very distinct roles depending on where you're at in the kayak. The front person, who was my wife, you're like the motor. You are just supposed to row. That's it. Just row. The whole time you're rowing, you're rowing, you're rowing. You can stop, take a break every once in a while, and I'll do some rowing. But like, really, you're just, you're powering the kayak. Your job is not to steer, not to worry, not to navigate. The back person, you carry the whole weight of the the trip. That's why I took it. You know, I was a selfless husband trying to serve. So it wasn't control freak at all. Like I was was trying to be nice, you know? So I took the back and I was navigating. He gave me a map. I haven't, I mean, Google Maps exist. I haven't navigated a map in my whole life, but he gave it to me. And so I was trying to figure it out and I'm in the back and I'm navigating and and I, I, I got us lost, you know? So we're out in the middle of this lake and the wind started to pick up and it started to blow and it started to make waves and then bigger waves and then bigger waves to the point we were panicking like trying trying so hard to get out of the middle of the lake but the wind is blowing you back in and the waves are kind of crashing over the kayak and we didn't have one of those fancy like waterproof things no waves were starting to maybe get in the kayak a little bit like the chance that we were going to drown in this lake and our marriage was literally going to be over because we were dead we're, we're escalating it was going it was going up it was in that moment my wife stopped trusting me right I'm in the back navigating, but she is now in the front navigating. And I'm, I'm, not, I'm, I'm talking loudly over the waves and the wind, but I'm trying to get her back on track. Like, no, 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 you're, you're, the, you're the motor. You got to row. You got to row because I can't do my job if she's not doing her job. But I'm all fake confidence in this point. You know, like there is no trust in myself anymore. I, don't, I got us in this situation. I don't know how to get us out of this situation. The whole time we're not trusting the kayak at all because it's filling with water and the waves and it's crazy. And I literally thought our marriage was going to be over because one, we were in danger, but also the trust in that situation was terrible. And it was in those moments where I was learning that life isn't in as much of our control as we like to hope. That when the weather went and the wind came and the waves came and I couldn't control them and I couldn't control what Allie was doing 
and I couldn't control what the guy at the kayak stand who sketchily sold us these, even though he probably knew a storm was coming, I couldn't control any of that. And whether we like it or not, life forces us to recognize our lack of control. We get to make our own decisions, but beyond that, there's so much outside of our control. Right now in your life, there are so many things going on that you cannot control. I mean, let's just start with the easiest one. Family stuff, anybody? Like, you got siblings that you just, you can't control their decisions and they just keep making these decisions. They keep doing those things and you want better for them. You want different for them. You want, but it doesn't matter what you want because you can't control them. Or you got parents where they're not loving you the way that you want. They're not loving each other the way that you want. You, you can't control them. Don't even get me started on extended family. You get aunts, uncles, cousins in the pics, grandparents, like, oh my goodness, you can't control any of them, yet they always have an opinion on your life, am I right? Like, it's just this difficulty of family, and you didn't choose any of that. But we can flip over and talk about the people that you did choose, your friends, and yet still there's this lack of control that we have, that maybe you have friends and they don't know Jesus, and you do, and your heart just breaks. You want so bad for them to know Jesus, but you can't control them. Or friends who do know Jesus, but yet they keep making poor decisions time and time and time again. They go back to that person or back to that thing, and you want better for them, but you can't control them. Let's not talk about relationships for a second, but let's just talk about, like, bodies. We have such little control over what happens to us. Like, you can eat right, exercise, and do the things, and still get sick, be in an accident. Maybe that's happened to you, it's happening to you, it's maybe it's happened to someone you know. The worst of it is there's this, this death thing we don't always love talking about, but we can't control that. Nobody's promised a certain amount of years, nobody's given the timeline for their, their perfect life, it's, none of that's in our control. And I've only begun to hit the surface with situations. We could start to talk about all the emotions that these situations elicit. Just this last week, I was driving and someone cut me off in Brookings. I was like, where are you going at this speed? It's not New York. Like, they cut me off and I'm instantly mad. I don't want to be mad, but I'm mad. You know, it's just, it just came out of me. I was just upset. My soccer team, they played this morning and they lost. And I was sad. I was sitting in a meeting and I was sad about a soccer team. I didn't want to be sad, but I was sad. This last week, I had stuff come into my life. There's just these things that just felt like they kept stacking up and I was anxious. I was worried. I was overwhelmed and I didn't want to feel any of that, but yet I couldn't control it. You get to pick what you do with your emotions. You get to make decisions about your life, yet still there is so much outside your control. Whether we like it or not, this life forces us to recognize we are not in control. And it's at this point I want to bring you some hope. That even though we are not in control, we can know the one who is. God is in control. When all of life feels crazy, when situation after situation just keeps coming at you, when you feel beat down, when you feel overwhelmed, when you feel empty, when, when it's just all crashing in, we can cling to a truth and have faith and know the one who is in control. God is in control. Another word for that is to say that God is sovereign. If I were to break that down for you, it's kind of a fancy word, but just hit a quick Google search and you'll come up with five definitions for God is, or for the word sovereign. The first one is the fact that God is a supreme ruler. That means there is no one over God. That's what it means that he is sovereign. He perfectly fulfills every single one of these definitions. The next one is that God possesses ultimate power. That there is no one in this universe, nothing in this universe that is more powerful than God. God acts independently and without interference that no one and nothing can interfere with what God has planned. That if he wants it to come to pass, it will come to pass. He is sovereign. God has royal status. That he is the king and creator of the universe. And finally, God is very good. And not only that, is he, he is also effective. That is what he is when he is sovereign. Steve stepped up and he crushed last week, telling us that God is good, not just in his nature, but also in his actions. Because God is sovereign. God is in control. To prove this all to you, I want you to open up to Mark 4. And as you flip there, I'm going to pray for us. Father, thank you tonight for your word. And thank you for the chance to gather as your people. Thank you for your spirit. I pray that you'd speak to us through your word, by your spirit. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Mark 4, starting in verse 35. 
says this. That day when evening came, he, being Jesus, said to his disciples, let us go over to the other side. Leaving the crowd behind, they took him along just as he was in the boat. There were also other boats with him, and a furious squall came up, and the waves broke over the boat so that it was nearly swamped. Jesus was in the stern, sleeping on the cushion. The disciples woke him up and said to him, teacher, don't you care if we drowned? He got up, rebuked the wind, and said to the waves, quiet, be still. Then the wind died down, and it was completely calm. He said to his disciples, why are you so afraid? Do you have still no faith? They were terrified and they asked each other, who is this? Even the wind and the waves obey him. This narrative account in Mark 4 appears in three of the four gospels, Mark, Matthew, and Luke. I've chosen to read from Mark tonight because I like the details that he includes. I also like it because Mark is my favorite book. I'm a little biased. I love the action in it as well. But this is our second time in Mark this semester already, but it's also our second time in Mark 4 this semester. If you remember back to the very first message of the year, maybe you were here, maybe you weren't. If you weren't, you can always catch it on YouTube. But I got to preach on the parable of the sower, where we learned that we are to spread seed and God takes care of the soil. That came from Mark 4. And actually, as Mark 4 goes on, it just describes one day in Jesus's life, that from there, he has just continued to travel along, and he's walking along the Sea of Galilee as he does. And he keeps teaching in parables, and he keeps proclaiming the good news. And at the same time, he's in the other gospels, you can see chronologically he's doing miracles and he's doing healing, that it's a super full and busy day. And finally, the chapter concludes with the experience we just read, that Jesus has decided to leave the crowds and head to the other side. And when he does that, he leaves everyone behind him except his disciples. And that word disciples, it can be kind of confusing, because usually we like to associate it with the OG 12 like Jesus and the boys, but it actually is a, it's a bigger group than that, that it could be as big as 70. And so Mark describes this squall, this, this, gr- or, sorry, this, this group of boats going across the lake. And everything seems to be going well. They might have been like Allie and I taking selfies and pictures, posing for the, the, the Instagram content, you know, like they might have been enjoying their day on the lake when things started to get wild. Verse 37 Mark says a furious squall came up. (laughs) I have never said the word squall in my life, but yet I still know what it means because Mark is telling us there is a storm, but it's not just any ordinary storm. The storm Mark is describing here is outrageous. It's crazy. They use the word furious, but when you look at the Greek, the word that is translated there is actually megas. It could just as easily be translated mega that what Mark is describing here is a mega storm. Think of the biggest, worst storm you could ever imagine in your life. Like maybe it was this last May or whatever when we had that derecho. That thing was crazy. It's the type of storm where the wind, the waves, the thunder, the lightning, the, the rain, everything is going so nuts that you and your family probably ran to the basement. It's the type of storm where if it would have happened in the south, they would have started to board up the windows. Jesus and his disciples are traveling the eight miles across the Sea of Galilee in its calm as day. And all of a sudden, as quick as a snap, it has turned into this mega storm. Interestingly enough, the Sea of Galilee is kind of known for these crazy storms. They're going to put up this picture. But the Sea of Galilee, I'm sorry, it looks like it's from Windows 97. But (laughs) it was the best one I could find. So the Sea of Galilee sits almost like this bowl between two mountain ranges. And it's common, even to today, they call this lake now Lake Tiberias, and it's common that the winds would whip down the mountain, crash into each other over the lake, and start to make these giant storms. That these would happen all the time. If you went there today, one of the warnings that they give you is still about these crazy storms that happen on the Sea of Galilee. That in the midst of a snap of a finger, it could go from icy calm to crazy winds. This is the setting Jesus finds himself. A nice sail through the night sigh, and now they're in the midst of impeccable danger and maybe even impending doom. I want you to check out this video too. Can you guys play that for me? There's no sound, so just imagine. I wish it had sound. (laughs) 
Unreal. That is why I have somewhat of a fear of water. That in my kayaking experience. <laughs> but I want us to get this picture in our minds. I want us to even a little bit wrestle with the fear, the anxiety, the danger the disciples felt. And I hesitated to show you that video because I don't want you to get the wrong picture of a boat. So they're gonna have another picture up there. This is more of the boat they would have rowed in. That this is a typical Galilean fishing boat. And they've actually found one of these on the bottom of the Sea of Galilee. They were able to dig it up. I wore my archeology span shirt. So they were able to dig it up and put it together and give us an estimate of what the boats were like. They were about 27 feet long, seven and a half feet wide, and four feet tall on the sides. If you were to measure that to the boats that we just saw in the video, they're not even a third of the size. And not only are they not the same size, but the boats in the video were made with metal. Very strong metal and welding, this is made with wood. And yet they find themselves in a storm of this magnitude. And as they do, verse 37 says, the waves are breaking over the boat. Not against the boat, over the boat. Five foot, seven foot, 10 foot waves cascading and crashing into the boat. It says the boat is slowly filling up with water. This is like most intense movie scenes where they're running out of air as the water just keeps coming higher. The anxiety is in. That's what you should feel reading the text when they have this storm. They are sinking. The possibility of death is imminent. Jesus and his disciples are in this rinky-dink fishing boat that's quickly filling up with water as the hurricane-type winds and waves smash over the boat. And where's Jesus? Where is God in the flesh, the savior of the universe? Where, where is he at? My man is asleep on that boat. <laughs> he is sawing logs, catching Z's. Like he is cashed out in the back of the boat. He's out for the count. That's why they're going to put that picture up there again. The stern is just the back of the boat. That some of us, we think maybe Jesus was under the deck. He was, it was like a yacht and he was like sleeping real good on his own cot. Like, no, no, no. He is in the back of the boat. That he's exposed to the elements. When the waves crashed, he got wet. When the wind blew, he was cold. My wife, I moved the comforter a little too far and she's awake. Jesus just slept through the storm of the century. <laughs> like, it's crazy. The text will also describe he had a pillow or a cushion back there. Other versions will say pillow. He might as well have a glass of milk and a blankie. He has taken a fat nap in the back of the boat. Like, it's crazy. It's unreal. And in some ways, we can't blame him. He's just had a crazy day. We read it in Mark 4. Teaching, healing, miracles. And so he deserves a good night's rest. But in another sense, we can be blown away, pun intended, at how he's sleeping in the midst of a storm. That's the reaction of the disciples. Not only are the disciples afraid of the storm, but they're angry at Jesus in the midst of the storm. <laughs> Notice how they wake him up. It's not like, hey, Jesus, we need your help. No, no, no. It's like, teacher, teacher, don't you care? We're going to drown. They're screaming at him. They're throwing accusations at him. He's getting berated the second he wakes up. There's still crust in his eyes as he's trying to figure out what is going on. But the disciples, they didn't care about Jesus' feelings. They thought they were going to die. They are shouting at him. In the dis different gospel accounts you can read, they use different titles to address Jesus when they start to yell at him. In Mark, they say, teacher. In Matthew, they say, Lord. In Luke, they say, uh, let me double check. In Luke, they say, master. In each and every single one, they are yelling at him. And people will point to this and they'll say, well, the Bible's textually inaccurate. That the people present for the scene can't even line up their details to know what the disciples were calling him. But scholars will agree that this inaccuracy that people will point at is more than likely a group of people on a boat panicked so bad they are screaming anything at Jesus to get him awake. Teacher! Master, Lord, Jesus, bro, dude, what? Get up, we're dying. That's what they're screaming at Jesus. They are freaking out. And as the ship is in chaos, the disciples are in chaos. It's fascinating when we begin to remember that somewhere between four and seven of Jesus' original 12 disciples had been career lifelong fishermen. Not just on some abstract lake, but on this lake. They had spent their whole lives fishing this same body of water. Chances are they'd seen hundreds, if not thousands of storms. But yet this one strikes them to the core. This one has them thinking they're doomed 
because chances are they're doomed. Eventually, Jesus gets up and he rebukes the wind. He yells into the storm. He commands the wind to stop. And what happens? What happens when the Son of God speaks to the chaos? It listens. Verse 39, the wind died down and it was completely calm. What was chaos is now calm. What was life threatening now listens to God in the flesh that is Jesus. Completely calm. I've got a couple last pictures for you. We had that. And then it became that. And in the middle, Jesus spoke and it changed everything. In the calm, Jesus would turn to his disciples and he would ask two questions. The first was simply this, why are you so afraid? Why are you so afraid? <laughs> I read it and I'm like, Jesus, come on, bro, that is a dumb question. And you're like, no, there's no dumb questions. No, Jesus, that is a dumb question. Like, it's a ridiculous question because they all just experienced this ridiculous storm. Like, they all went through this together. They literally thought they were going to die. And he's like, dude, why are you so afraid? Jesus experienced the same storm the disciples did, but his response was so different from theirs. While they were shaking in their boots, Jesus slept. They could only focus on the storm. Jesus was able to focus on the one who controlled the storm. The disciples knew only the wind, the waves, and the water, while Jesus knew who was in control. Jesus knew God was in control. Even crazier than that is when we understand that Jesus is God. He's actually part of the Trinity. He is God in the flesh, God incarnate, the Son of God. He is in control. He actually is trying to teach them this even in how he rebukes the wind. He says to the waves and the wind, he says, quiet, be still. Really simple commands, but with profound connections. Maybe you didn't recognize it, but the disciples of this day sure would have. The disciples were Jewish, and therefore they would have studied the Old Testament law. Some of them even would have had passages of it memorized. So when he says, be still, they would have recognized he's referencing a line from Psalm 46. I'm going to read you some of it. Psalm 46, God is our refuge and strength, an ever-present tr help in trouble. Therefore, we will not what? We will not fear. Remember the first question Jesus asked, why are you so afraid? Then Psalm 46 begins to vividly describe a scene to us. See if this reminds you of anything. Through, though the earth give way and the mountains fall into the heart of the sea, though its waters roar and foam and the mountains quake with their surging, the psalmist is describing a raging storm eerily similar to the ones the disciples are currently experiencing, yet the psalmist brings peace to the storm as he reminds the reader that God is within her. She will not fail. God will help her at break of day. Nations are in uproar. Kingdoms fall. Chaos is everywhere. But God lifts his voice and the earth melts. God speaks and the earth is calm. The Lord Almighty is with us. That psalm wraps up with God himself speaking and saying, be still and know that I am God. The same words Jesus spoke when he was rebuking the storm, be still. As Jesus stands in the midst of the storm, chaos at every turn, the end feels inevitable, nothing is going their way, he lifts his voice and he says, what? Be still, reminding them that he is God. Not only that, but God is in control. He's trying to teach them this, that he is the same God that in Genesis 1, he spoke over the chaos of the waters and made creation. The same God that has authority not only to teach, not only to heal, not only to drive out demons, but to control every aspect of creation. Jesus rebukes the, the, like the wind and the waves the way the parent rebukes a child. In the wind and the waves, they submit to the one who spoke them into existence. That same God is in their boat right now. He's present with them in their situation. And so Jesus asked the question, why are you so afraid? 
if we could translate it, he's also asking, don't you know that I am God? Don't you know that I am in control? He will then turn and ask a second question. He says to the disciples, do you still have no faith? Where at first Jesus was poking at their intellect, their knowledge, he was questioning, did they really believe? Now he's questioning their belief. Two distinctly different ideas, this idea of knowing and believing, of intellect and faith. We can kind of get it mixed up in our Midwestern culture because many of us, we know God is in control. You can just check that box if you attended Sunday school or you've heard a sermon like this in the past. Like just growing up in church, chances are you've heard God is sovereign. You know it. But the question becomes, will you believe it? Believing God is in control means you have faith. That the knowledge and the intellect, the ideas that you know, transform your heart and the faith in God's sovereignty radically reshapes your entire life. As you look around, there's a good chance there's some crazy wicked storms brewing in your life. Anybody ever feel like they're drowning at school? Sinking at work? Like your romantic life is just chaos. Like your family's falling apart. Like your body's breaking down. Like your mind's in a panic. The storms just keep brewing. And it's in the midst of that we are prone to panic. Prone to fear. And when fear is creeping in, faith is the answer. When fear is creeping in like it wants to, like it will, faith is the answer. But this isn't some faith rooted in our own ability. It's not some start shoveling out buckets of water to try to save the drowning ship. It's not some pull up your bootstraps, try harder, work at work more kind of faith. No, 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 it's not any of that. It's not trusting ourselves more, it's trusting God more. The message of culture is simply that. Grab your bucket and start bailing. Because if you don't help, no one will. The message of Christianity is this one where if you come to God, he is in control. Not only that, but he loves you. Come to a God who in Romans 8, 28 has this promise that to all who love him, he desires good. That is the promise of the Father. Good according to his purpose. Come to Jesus. The Bible will go and define faith itself. Hebrews 11.1. Now faith is confidence in what we hope for and assurance about what we do not see. Faith is confidence. Saying I believe God is who he is. These three weeks we have looked at only three of the many, many, many attributes of God. The list could go on and on. We could preach this sermon the rest of the year. But in each and every one of those will we believe and have confidence that God is who he says he is. He's in control and we can leave confidently believing that. But do we also have faith that is assurance that he will do what he promised? That God will provide in what he's promised? Now that won't always look like your perfect five year, 10 year career plan to the corner office. It won't probably mean You get the perfect transcript you've always dreamed of when you came to college. It might not mean your dream fall wedding happens in 2023 like you've been praying it will. It might not even mean you get to have kids or have the amount of kids you want. Maybe your whole family, your whole future will look different than what you have pictured right now. But you can leave with this faith that God works all things to the good of those who love him. You can leave with that faith, trusting in him that he will provide. God is in control. So much of our lives are outside of our control, but none of it is outside God's control. None of it. We get to trust him. We get to. We get to put our hope, our trust, and our faith in him. The passage will finish with verse 40 and 41. I've read them to you already, but I'll read them to you again. Jesus said to his disciples, why are you so afraid? Do you still have no faith? They were terrified and they asked each other, who is this? Even the wind and the waves obey him. 
to maybe most of you, this can be a confusing end to the, the, to the story. Because in the midst of the storm, we understood why they were afraid, right? Like, they were going to drown. We saw the video. We saw the pictures. We heard my dumb story. Like, we understood they were going to drown. Like, they were, they were scared. That's okay. They, they, but they got rebuked in that, and Jesus was teaching them something else. But now he's calmed the storm. They sit back on this glassy sea, this, this perfect night, sailing as if nothing has happened. And they sit there, and they're still afraid. It says actually now that they are terrified. Hadn't they just seen Jesus calm the storm? Weren't they somewhat believing that God was in control? Why are they still afraid? I'll invite the team up. It's because the fear that they were experiencing at first has transformed. It's changed. It is a different type of fear. The first time in verse 40, the Greek word used there is delos. And that word truly means fear as we experience it in our Western culture. This season is one marked by fear where you are meant to cower and be scared in the midst of all the things around you. That is the word delos in Greek. But now Mark has described their condition within the storm, within the calm in verse 41 and uses the Greek word phobio. And that word phobio, it, it does translate as fear, but it also means reverence and worship. This fear that does not cower, but will stand in worship. This fear that will not run away, but will boldly proclaim God is in the boat. They were so overwhelmed with the fact that Jesus was God sitting in their boat, they were struck with fear, phobio. And that led them to worship when the disciples knew that Jesus was God and they had faith that he was in control of all things, they responded in worship. When we learn that God is in control, our only response, our correct response, is worship. Today I was preparing for this, and Jaina does a lot of work early in the week. She can be an overachiever, she's amazing. And so she had the whole thing planned. And I texted her, I was like, you know what? I feel like we gotta move some pieces because I wanted us to have ample time tonight to respond to God's sovereignty. I wanted us to be able to sing and worship and praise because he's worthy. I wanted us to be able to stand here tonight and through the next three songs, take every ounce of energy and breath that we have in our lungs and pour it back to God because he's in control. To respond in obedience, not with one of fear, but with one of faith in reverence and in worship to the one who has created us, to the one who will speak to the storm, not just in Mark, but to the storm in your life. Whatever you're walking through, whatever you're struggling with, school, family, friends, faith, finances, will you bring it to the cross tonight? That our God in Philippians 4 says he will bring you the peace that transcends understanding. You know what doesn't make sense? Jesus sleeping in a boat when it's storming. You know what also doesn't make sense? When Christians in this world walk with faith when fear is the correct response to everyone else. It doesn't make any sense. But that is the promise of God. Will you pray with me? Father, thank you tonight for the chance to open your word. <laughs> and even now we get to respond in faith that this fear that's described, God, we just, it, it's worship. It's worship in its truest and its most real sense. Worship that the God of all creation is here with us tonight. He has poured his spirit out. Where Jesus says, where two or three are present, I am there. Jesus is in the room. He is in the boat with us. And we get to respond in worship. So with everything that we have, would you help us to trust you? And would you take that trust and would you respond to that with peace? And would you lead us into this week, into this semester, into our workplaces, and into just our holistic life, God, with the trust that you are in control. We love you and we praise you. It's in Jesus' name.